Hey everyone, it's Kendall from the Recording Lounge Podcast, and on today's episode, we're having a conversation about depth. Now, I've gotten the compliment from podcast listeners, from my assistant, and even from clients that my mixes have a lot of depth, and I'll admit it is something that I work very hard on trying to achieve in my mixes, but I really wanted to try to deconstruct what I'm thinking about when it comes to depth, how I approach depth, where it comes from, how to get more of it, and so I thought I would do an episode about it. So let's get started. So the first thing I wanted to do is split up depth into three different categories, three different types of depth. To me, it doesn't all come from one place. The first type is natural depth. This is the sense of depth that exists from miking things farther away, using different polar patterns, using room mics, etc. This is mostly created from the time delay, the air compression, the distance from the source to the mic, um, microphone characteristics, early reflections, proximity effect, room reflections, all that stuff. So it's natural depth that exists on the recording through your recording techniques. The second type is manufactured depth, and this is the type of depth that we manufacture using delays, reverbs, time-based effects, and EQ. And the third type, I would say, is perceived depth. And this is the combined perceived effect of all of these factors, including the natural and manufactured depth, but also the density of a mix, how much space is in a mix, the levels and volumes within your mix, the panning. This one is probably the hardest to describe because it's not just one thing that creates this effect. In fact, it's everything, and it's how everything interplays. Much of what we're doing when thinking about depth from a recording standpoint or a mixing standpoint is we're creating an illusion for the listener. We're trying to take them somewhere. And so that accounts for all of these factors, but unless we do it in the right way, it won't be perceived as depth. So I wanted to take some time and break down each of these categories a little bit more so you can understand some of the tools and techniques and methodologies for achieving depth in each phase. Let's talk about some ways to create natural depth. One of the first and easiest ways to create natural depth is by miking things off axis. Now, it doesn't add a whole lot of depth, but miking things off axis does three important things. First, for most microphones, it will slightly roll off the very highest frequencies. Second, it reduces a little bit of the pressure buildup from the source, particularly things like air movement from a speaker or plosives from a vocalist or the sort of pressure low-end rumble that comes from an acoustic instrument with a sound hole. And third, it reduces some of the detail by not having the mic directly pointed at the source. Now, how much of an angle, I can't really say, but sometimes just a little bit off axis, just angled a little bit, will reduce some of that hyper detail, hyper precision. And by doing that, we sort of fool the ear into thinking something is not hyper detailed and right in our ears, right? What we're trying to do with a lot of mic placement is position the listener's ear at you know, instrument X, Y, Z. We're trying to say, here's what I want you to perceive about this instrument. And of course, if you're getting like a hyper detailed piano sound or a hyper detailed electric guitar sound, what we're telling our listener's ear is, this is where your ear is. You are one inch from the guitar speaker. So if you want something to have depth, that's not the approach we want to take. Another obvious way that you can create depth is by just miking something farther away. When you mic things farther away, you build in depth into the sound. Yes, it is a risk in some situations because you can't really remove it from the recording, but if you know what you're doing and you have a great sounding room, the rewards can be great. When you mic things further away, a lot of things happen. First and foremost, you begin to hear more of the room sound, whatever that room sound may be. And even if it's subtle and quite controlled in the room, it will start to get into the mic more. At a certain point that we call the critical distance, the room sound will be effectively the same volume as the source sound. And beyond this point, the room begins to dominate the sound of what you're hearing. Miking further away also changes how a microphone responds dynamically. Typically, they're less detailed and a little less articulate. 
and the air pressure vibrating the element is a bit more evenly dispersed and softer edged, if that makes sense. You're spreading out that energy from the source rather than blasting it into a single focused point. A practical example of how this works is plosives and the use of pop filters. When we put a microphone really, really close onto a vocalist, there's a high chance of strong plosives because the air pressure coming out of their mouth is very strong. Now, we can place the mic farther away and we can also use a pop filter to help sort of spread out that air pressure and make it less intense at that point. I had a video about this on my YouTube channel that might explain it a little better, but my point is when you mic things really close, there's, it's much more likely to be super sensitive to pressure differences in the source, whether it's vocalist or a guitar amp or an acoustic to guitar and it's not just proximity effect that's where i think some people can get confused it's also that the element is getting blasted with more sound now on that note electrically speaking you're less likely to distort or overload a mic if it's placed a little bit farther away which makes the sound less colored have less harmonic distortion and typically it will lose a little bit of fullness or thickness or warmth but again if something sounds far away it's probably not going to have this super intimate full huge low end so that works in your favor miking things farther away also changes the tonality of things drastically by my research and some very general estimates i find about a half db of top end loss per double distance. So moving from one foot to two feet might result in about 0.5 dB of top end above three or four K reduced. The bottom end is more sensitive. And of course, this is mostly due to proximity effect. My research suggests more like one dB per double distance starting around 500 Hertz, pretty high. I think people assume that proximity effect starts at, you know, 100, 200 Hertz, but it actually starts quite high. So put all this together and for example if you wanted to make something sound like it was mic'd up 16 feet away instead of one foot that's four doublings meaning minus 4 db of bottom end and minus 2 db of top end now that's really not as much as you might think i think some people try to make things sound far away and they just filter out all their top end and bottom end and that's probably a little bit too drastic but again, I'm just talking about the effect of microphones at this distance. It doesn't necessarily factor in Fletcher Munson, and this effect will be even more drastic from a perception standpoint. If you look at a graph of the equal loudness contours or the Fletcher Munson curve, you'll find that these same frequency boundaries are significant. 500 hertz to three or four K, that's where our hearing is most sensitive. So even if things move farther away, we're still gonna hear a lot in that region. This also gets complicated because the way that we mix things, sometimes when you add mid-range, it makes things sound closer to you. Now, that seems to directly contradict what I just said, where rolling off some bottom and top end will make things sound farther away. But it gets interesting when it comes to microphones because if you look at a frequency response graph of the off-axis sound of a mic, right, the back of the microphone or the side of the microphone, typically that's a very scooped sound. It looks like a big mid-scoop, like a kick drum curve or something. And so that's a weird phenomenon where a lot of times what we're used to hearing in the back of a mic or in the bleed of a mic is a relatively scooped room sound. And that's a strange phenomenon. It's also interesting to note that most rooms have more low frequency content than high frequency content. As many of you probably know, it's much easier to treat high frequencies than it is to treat low frequencies. You can absorb 10K with a t-shirt, but you can't absorb 100 hertz that easily. It takes a lot more treatment, a lot more depth, and very often some sort of resonating or pressure-based device to actually kill 100 hertz and below. So rooms typically have a lot of low end. It's one of those weird things where a lot of people will roll off all the bottom end on their reverbs because they don't want it to get muddy. But then they complain that none of the reverbs actually seem to have that much depth. And again, all of this comes back to the illusion that we're creating. We're going to talk a lot more about this as this goes on. It's also important to understand that as you mic something farther away, you're changing the balance of close sound to room sound. And if that room sound does have a lot of low end, then you're technically getting more low end from the room and less low end from the source right? Like the source sound is not changing. It's sending a full range sound into the room. So we're hearing a combination of the source sound at a distance 
plus the full range sound as it reflects around the room. Now, it's also interesting to note that just the act of using a microphone far away on something, typically you're actually recording a different thing. It's no longer a close drum mic, right? When you mic drums from 10 or 15 feet away, you're miking the side of the kit, right? You're not miking the top of the snare or the top of the toms anymore. You're actually pointing it at a different part entirely. Right? Very few people would call that a room mic if you placed it over the kit 10 or 15 feet up. That's just an overhead. It's a very, very different sound. An overhead is a very different sound than a room mic. So the perception of it and the way we perceive it is actually closer to how somebody would be hearing it in a room. Right, They would be standing in front of the kit. That's what we're used to hearing. So you can't just reduce room mics to, hey, I'm getting more room sound. It's actually much more complex than that. You're not just getting more room sound. It's not the same as just adding a reverb, right? You're getting a very complex input now. You're possibly changing the directionality of the source by miking up the side of it or the front of it instead of the top of it uh, in the case of drums. But you're also hearing more room sound, more room tone, because the reflections and room modes and all that stuff within the room are now making up a larger portion of the sound. Anyway, so I just wanted to clarify that it's not the same as just adding a reverb to a close mic. So if you want more depth from your recordings, miking things farther away is a great technique, particularly if there's contrast in your mic techniques. For example, if your lead vocal is mic'd very close, then you're defining that level of intimacy for the listener. You're telling the listener, this is how close the vocalist is. But then if you add different vocal mics that are mic'd farther away, those vocals will sound naturally, literally farther away from the listener than the lead vocal because they are. And that's a technique that I do sometimes where I'm miking certain backing vocals a little bit farther away from the lead. Maybe not all of them. It just kind of depends what their function is. But the same applies for instruments. If you have room mics on your drums and you're actually using them in your blend, then they're probably going to tell the listener's ear, hey, that's farther away. I mean, I think we don't give our ears enough credit. I know that our ears are flawed and there's a lot of frustrating things about our hearing. But for example, if you closed your eyes and walked into a room and started talking, most audio engineers would have a pretty good sense of like, wow, I'm in a big room now. Or wow, how I'm in a really small room, we can hear it instantly and we could get a decent estimate of how big that room is just from hearing the reflections. It's pretty remarkable that our ears are able to do that, but it also proves just how important it is that those early reflections are telling our ears about the sense of space and the sense of depth and, for example, how far away is the closest wall to us that we're hearing. Now, a few more things about room mics that I wanted to mention. You know, room mics are one of my favorite ways to add depth to a sound and give it size and space. And it's impossibly hard to recreate the sound of room mics using a reverb. Because again, it's not the same thing as putting a reverb on a close mic. The sound of the instrument changes at a distance. And recreating all those early reflections and the off-axis sound of a mic and all of these other factors are just really difficult. I, I've yet to to find a reverb plugin on the market that can do what a room mic does. Now, I'm a big fan of using stereo room mics on a lot of things. I like spaced pairs, but I also like XY and Blumline using two figure eights. For something to be really effective as a room mic, I find that it has to be at least five or six feet away, but sometimes more like 10 or 15 feet to really work. If it's too close, it doesn't really sound like a room mic. It starts to just sound like a close mic that you placed far away. <laughs> now, it still can add a sense of depth, but you have to almost think of your production as layers of depth, right, from front to back. And if you place a mic three feet away from something, sure, you are setting it back into your mix just a little bit. But that's not really a room mic at that point. That's just a, a little bit of depth injected into a close mic. Right. So when you really want something to sound roomy or like it is in the room, back in the room, you're talking more about the layers of depth that are like your back wall, so to speak. And we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. But you need to place those mics farther away. Now, I used to be a bit more of a fan of like a mono room mic, but I've gotten away from that. 
I'm trying to be more careful about how much mono ambience I'm using because it can very quickly cloud up a mix, but it is an effective technique if you want something that's not quite as large as stereo, but not quite as small as no room mic, right? So for example, if you mic a guitar amp close and then you add a room mic, a single room mic 15 feet away, but you pan them both to the same side, that can be a really effective technique. It's almost like turning up a reverb on that guitar or a slap delay or something like that. But you can also play around a little bit with panning that mono room mic, let's say 50% left, and then your close mic is 100% left. And that creates this sort of curvature to the mix. It creates this sort of, hey, we've got some ambience, but it's not really a full stereo width thing. So the mono room mic can be helpful, but in a lot of situations, I'd rather just use a stereo room mic and ditch one side if I don't need if I don't need it, you know. Or I can just pan around the width of the stereo room mic and make it as wide or narrow as I want. For example, I could pan a space pair of room mics 100% left and center, and I, I could get sort of a 50% average on my left. And a lot of times I just like how that sounds better. Now, obviously this one is a little bit tricky for those home studio enthusiasts who maybe don't have a large enough room to get a room mic sound. And for that, I'd still say, try it. Again, it, the sound at a distance changes a lot. So even if you don't have a lot of ambience in your room, so many other factors are changing at a distance. And, you know, there's been a lot of records out there recorded in small, tight studio spaces that don't have a lot of decay. But just the act of moving the mic farther away, it's a complex thing. It changes a lot. So still try it, even if you don't have a lot of, quote, room sound. Another thing that can help add a sense of depth to your recordings is using different polar patterns. And we can use these to, again, build in layers of depth into your recordings. For example, omni patterns will have no proximity effect and they'll pick up from all directions. So they'll naturally pick up more room sound and a less boomy, huge, close sound. So even if you're miking close, this can be a cool effect that gives you a little bit more depth. And it's sort of an interesting hybrid because you're still getting these direct high frequencies and it's telling your listener, hey, I'm close to this thing, but having it as an omni pattern tells the listener's ear, I'm close to it, but I'm still in a room. It's also helpful to experiment with the polar patterns on your mics that are specifically supposed to be room mics or distant mics. For example, if you're in a smaller room and you don't necessarily have a lot of room ambience, one of the ways to help get more ambience on your room mics is to use them in Omni, or at least figure eight. If you're using a cardioid mic or a hypercardioid mic, you're naturally going to get a more focused sort of forward pointing sound. But if the point of the mic is to be a room mic, I mean, that's one of the ways that Omni mics can be really, really cool is by getting a ton of room sound. So that's something I've been experimenting with a little bit more. Over the years, I have gradually deadened the sound of my live room, not only because of trends being a little bit drier in the last five, 10 years, but because I find that if I make my room a little bit drier, but then place mics farther away and make them Omni or figure eight, it's a similar kind of sound. I feel like I get a similar result to having the room be more lively, but then use cardioid mics, if that makes sense. And ultimately having the room just a little bit drier makes sure that the things I need to sound close, like vocal or acoustic instruments in some cases, do indeed sound close. And I'm not just washing out everything in my production. Now, another subtle way to create more natural depth in your recordings is to use microphones that have a flatter off-axis response. I mentioned this before, but usually the off-axis response of a microphone is not much to write home about. It's kind of a strange scooped sound a lot of times. Sometimes it can sound pretty bad, but other times the mic has been intentionally designed to have very good off-axis response. This is really common for like small diaphragm mics from DPA, but it's also seen in some large diaphragm designs like Sanken or MyLab that are purposely designed to have a flatter off-axis response. And when the off-axis response is relatively flat, it seems to capture almost a wider, more natural or neutral sound. And it often presents the source with a bit more depth, even as a mono source. 
So when the off-axis response is really scooped in the mids, you don't hear as much of the space that the source is in, which is nice in some cases because it tends to make the sound really intimate and upfront. But again, if you're trying to create some depth, you might not find that useful. You might use something like that for a vocal, but if you're recording an instrument that you don't want to sound super, super close, you might try a microphone that has a flatter off-axis response. Now, in general, large diaphragm microphones tend to have worse off-axis response than small diaphragm microphones, so just keep that in mind as a rule of thumb. And one final way to create natural depth is to make use of bleed. Now, if utilized correctly, bleed between different mics can essentially function almost like a room mic, and in a lot of cases, it can add a lot of depth to the production. Now, I'm not talking about, like, hi-hat bleed on your snare mic. I'm talking more like if you're recording drums and piano and guitar in the same room at the same time, and you get bleed on your guitar mics and piano mics that has drum in it, and the piano and guitar bleed in your drum mics has a similar kind of thing. This can often lead to very interesting sounds, sounds that are quite different from just room mics, because, again, a lot of times the microphones that we're trying to place for rejection purposes are pointed in opposite directions, right? Like the back of a cardioid mic is pointed at our drums, and that would be more like, quote, bleed. But if we're using a room mic, typically we're pointing those at the drums. So if you want a microphone to sound a bit more like a bleed capture, try pointing it a different direction. Pretend you're miking up something else in the room and you're purposely trying to reject that other thing. A lot of times that means pointing your room mics the opposite direction. And that's there's nothing wrong with doing that. In fact, it can work really well. Now, obviously, bleed is very annoying in some cases, so take this with a grain of salt. I'm just saying, by the very nature of having a lot of mics in one room, picking up a little bit of everything, it tends to create a unique sense of depth versus just everything being dry and recording individual mics with no bleed and all the ambience being manufactured in post or setting up these, like, hyper-awesome room mics. It's different than bleed. Again, this also goes back to the off-axis response of microphones. If you are miking up a guitar amp and the back of it is pointing at your drums, then your, quote, room mic is almost entirely comprised of the off-axis sound of the guitar mic. So that's something to keep in mind. So next I wanted to talk about manufactured depth and the ways that we manufacture it, particularly in a mix. The first concept I wanted to talk about, and this is something that has really helped me in my career to understand what I'm trying to do, is the idea of defining the walls when we're talking about reverb and delay and mic techniques and really all of this. Defining the walls is the idea that whatever you're doing, whether it's a mix thing or a recording thing, you're understanding that you are creating each reflection that happens by what you're applying to that source. For example, if you mic a vocal in a dry room with a cardioid mic and you mic it very close, essentially what you're doing is defining the front wall. You're defining the thing that is closest to you. You're saying this is the closest thing in this mix. And a lot of times it's the vocal. Now, it could be something else, but a lot of times the vocal is the closest thing. Now, if you wanted to define the back wall using your vocal, then you would probably need to put on some kind of reverb. Now, if you put on a small room reverb and turn it up really loud, then what you're telling the listener is this vocal is in a room and the walls are not that far away. You're hearing quite a bit of room sound and you're essentially pushing your vocalist back into that room. And that changes your front wall, but it also defines your back wall as not being that far away. But if instead you added a longer reverb, let's say a second or a second and a half to the vocal, and you made it a bit darker and you cut out some low end, you gave it some pre-delay and made it fairly subtle, then what you're telling the listener is, hey, there's a wall back there, but it's far away. It's not very loud because, you know, the reflections lose a lot of energy by the time they get back to us. My vocalist is still standing close to me, right? I recorded the vocalist close. They're still standing close to me. But by adding this bigger reverb that is quieter, I've successfully maintained my front wall and defined my back wall as being back there. 
Now, if I wanted to add like a doubler effect, like waves doubler or sound toys, micro shift or something like that, essentially what I'm doing there is defining my side walls. I am putting a delay on the left and a delay on the right. There's a little bit of pitch modulation going on, but essentially I'm defining how wide the room is. And these delays are usually very short on doubler type effects, right? So by that combination of a slight subtle doubler effect and that bigger reverb that is turned down, I have now defined my front wall, my side walls, and my back wall. Maybe an easier example to understand is, let's say you record a guitar up close, right? And you put an SM57 on a guitar cabinet, you record it, you're defining your front wall, right? You're saying this guitar is very close to the listener. So just by adding a simple slap delay, let's say 100 milliseconds, right? You've got your guitar pan center and you've got a slap delay pan center. Essentially what you're defining is that the wall is 50 feet away. We talked about this on our last episode about equations. And if something is 50 feet away from you, then the full signal path would be 50 feet to the wall and 50 feet back. And it's, again, roughly about a foot per millisecond. In reality, 100 feet would actually be more like 88 milliseconds, but you get the idea. That's a simple explanation of defining that back wall. Now, if I take that guitar and pan it to the left, but I pan the slap delay to the right, I'm essentially defining the width of the room, right? I'm telling the listener the guitar is over here near this wall. And by adding that slap delay on the right side, I'm saying this is how wide that room is. Does that make sense? Now, I want to be clear, it's not that I do this on every single source in a mix. It's not that I'm really trying to define the walls every single time. I'm more using these as examples of just showing how I think about it and the function of a reverb, the function of a delay, what am I using it for? Very often it's a combination of short reverbs, short delays, long reverbs, and each serves an important purpose. Sometimes reverbs are not for depth, you know, sometimes they're just an effect in the truest sense of the word. They're not always there to sound real or define the walls or define a space. They're there to define a mood or an emotion or a vibe or an era. Like a spring reverb, for example, sounds very 50s, sounds very 50s, 60s, right? Now, if you're trying to use reverbs or delays to define a space, a lot of times they're more subtle than when you're using them for effect. And I think that's something that people tend to get wrong. I hear it in a lot of amateur mixes where the vocal just has way too much reverb and it's them trying to define a space, but it ends up sounding like an effect because you've got it way too loud. And it, again, ruins that sort of front to back wall perception. You're shoving this vocalist 20 feet away from me by having way too much reverb on that vocal. But if you put a spring reverb on a vocal, which doesn't really sound real at all, you can still make that vocal sound close to you. And it tells the listener that this is clearly an effect. Now, of course, it depends how you do it, the exact kind of spring re reverb, how loud it is and so on. But what I'm getting at is when you're trying to define a space, typically we're going to be using more like room or chamber type reverbs and short delays. And many times when you're trying to define space, those are the kinds of things that you want to share between multiple instruments. For example, a good room reverb. Maybe the guitars get a little bit of that room reverb. Your snare gets a little bit of room reverb. And maybe even your vocal gets a tiny bit of room reverb. But if you're trying to accomplish more vibe from the vocal or a larger sense of space or atmosphere or whatever, then you might go for a plate or a spring reverb or a longer like quarter note or eighth note delay. That's not the type of thing that's going to sound real, but it will add a vibe to the vocal. Now, reverb and delay do take up a lot of space, just like instruments. So the denser your mix is, the harder it will be to hear them, which will cause you to turn them up, which will cause you to have a mushy mix. And I think a lot of people think the solution is take all the bottom end out of your reverbs, but I would hesitate to do that. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. So let's talk a little bit about specifics of delay and reverb. So in terms of creating space and depth, the most commonly used delays, at least for me, are pretty short. 
slap delays, doublers, even chorus effects sometimes, or like micro shift kind of things. Once you get into timed delays, like eighth note, quarter note, etc., they become much more of an effect. And they still can be helpful for creating depth, but not as much as a shorter delay. In some cases, with careful timing and feedback and tonality, you can use slower delays to create a sense of depth, especially if it's very wide. By making a delay super wide, you can fool the listener into thinking that something is pushed back in the center, which sort of creates a perceived depth, right? Like almost like a concave center of your mix. It's an illusion. And in this case, you're not actually adding something that deep. You're adding something wide, which creates contrast with your center. And that can make it seem, ironically, kind of farther away. Now, if your delay is too bright or too fat, then it will sound too close. But if it's too thin or too dark, it won't really sound like much at all. In fact, it will probably just melt into the background and form a bit of a wash or it will sound like an effect. There's a really weird line when it comes to filtering out your effects. And like I said, I don't think it's a good idea to just roll off the bottom end of your effects by default. There's not really an easy answer here. Each delay is different. I don't know exactly what type of delay you're starting with, right? If you're starting with Echo Boy, that's very different than starting with the stock delay plugin within your DAW. When it comes to tonality and feedback, you really have to experiment with this. Every delay is different. Typically, when doing short delays for depth, there's no feedback. It's literally just like one slap or one reflection. And the same is true for like doubler effects. There's usually no feedback on those delays. Now, when it comes to creating depth and space and size from reverbs, I would consider using rooms or chambers or halls. In terms of effect reverbs, I find it more common for me to use plates or springs or even something like a lexicon 480L type thing. Sometimes these can sound actually quite fake, but very, very cool at the same time. And just like delays, the tonality of your reverb is extremely important and I, I do think it's a mistake to cut out all of the bottom end of your reverbs, especially if you're trying to make it sound more like a real room, right? Real rooms, like we talked about, can sometimes have a lot of bottom end. Not always, of course, but doing anything habitually without thinking about it is really just bad engineering practice. So let's think about it, right? Remember earlier when I mentioned using a room mic, you pull it back from the source and you're getting more natural low end from the source. And imagine that that room mic is your listener and you're placing the listener in this spot, right? Now think about the difference of what the room mic is getting when you move it farther away, okay? So as you move that room mic farther away, the brightness of the source typically changes, the low end proximity effect of that source changes, and your gut reaction might be, oh, oh, I need to take out the low end and top end from my reverbs, but that's not really what's happening because as you move that room mic farther away, you're getting more low end from the room and sometimes, in fact, a lot of low end. So here's a thought experiment for you. Let's say you're trying to create the illusion that you are standing close to a vocal, but the room is far away, right? You're placing the listener at the vocalist's mouth, right? Like two inches away from their face. Okay, so what is close to you? The vocalist, which means you're going to get a lot of bottom end and top end from the vocal. The room is far away. What's coming back to you is most likely going to be primarily mid-range. It's not going to have a lot of bottom end and top end partly because the low frequencies of that singer are going in all directions and they're trying to escape. And a lot of times they do escape because they can just go right through a wall. Now, the high frequencies are easily absorbed by seating or even by carpet or by t-shirts or whatever. So the sound that often comes back in a larger room is typically very mid-range heavy. And if you put up a measurement mic in a large room, the assumption, I think, by most acousticians is that the decay K time will be longest in the mid-range. That's very common. Now, of course, the denser the walls are, the more low end will be retained in that room and the less it will sort of spill out of any crevice that it can find and the less it will just pass right through a wall. Now, instead, let's say we wanted it to sound like our vocalist was in a medium-sized room, but not up close to you, okay? So now we're more of like, we're moving the microphone, right? We are, we're now telling our listener's ear, the microphone is farther from the vocalist. They are farther back in the room. So when you move a microphone farther away from a source, you're getting low end from the room and you're losing top end from the source, 
Now, that's a very different experience than losing top end from the reverb or losing bottom end from the reverb, okay? So just to rephrase that, if you want the reverb to sound far away, not the source, but the reverb to sound far away, then you need to cut out some bottom end and probably some top end. But if you want the source to sound farther away, you need to cut some top end and bottom end on the source, and you want the reverb to have more low end and top end. What this means is if I'm trying to make something sound like room mics or like my guitar is placed farther back in the room and not close to me, I'm probably going to be using a relatively short room reverb that has plenty of bottom end, right? I'm pushing the source back into the room and I'm probably going to go for a darker source sound. But if I want the guitar or vocal or whatever to sound close to me, but like it's in a bigger room, I'm going to use a longer reverb that is quieter, that has less bottom and less top. Just to illustrate this, I'm going to show you examples of that. I'll just use a guitar, okay? So what you're going to hear is a guitar sound, pan to the left, with a room reverb that is fairly short, about three quarters of a second, and it has plenty of bottom end and top end. In fact, it's a little bit scooped out in terms of EQ. I want it to sound more like a room mic and the off-axis stuff that comes with it and the healthy bottom end of a room. And my close mic sound, I've taken out a little bit of bottom and top to make this guitar feel like it's pushed back into the room. Now, instead, I'm going to turn the reverb down a little bit. I'm going to make it a little bit longer. I'm going to make it a little bit thinner, and I'm going to make it a little bit darker. Another big thing I'm doing is increasing the amount of pre-delay. Our first example had a relatively short pre-delay, about 30 milliseconds, which, again, simulates that the walls are about 15 feet away, right? 15 feet there, 15 feet back. But on this one, I'm making the pre-delay about 80 milliseconds. So this is now like the walls are 40 feet away. That's something that I think a lot of people confuse about pre-delay. They think, oh, uh, I need to add more pre-delay if I want this to sound farther away. It's like, no, when you're adding pre-delay, you're making the reverb sound farther away, not the source. And what I'm trying to simulate here is that the guitar is close to me, but the reverb is farther away. So I'm going to switch back and forth between those so you can hear the difference. Again, the first one is I'm trying to simulate that the guitar itself is pushed farther back into the room. And the room reverb has more low end, it is shorter, it has a shorter pre-delay, and the guitar has a little bit less bottom and top. On the second example, it's again going to switch back and forth. Second example, the guitar is close to me, it has more bottom and top. The room reverb has less bottom and top, longer pre-delay, and slightly more late reflections, slightly longer length. So I hope you can hear that difference. I hope you can hear that the first example and the third example sound farther back in the room. And it's the same exact reverb plugin. It's Valhalla Room. There's nothing crazy about it. It's a plugin we all love and use. And really the main difference is how you're affecting the source and the reverb in contrasting ways. So one clever way to get more bottom and top out of your, quote, room reverbs or room mic style reverbs 
is to send your source mic, whether that's a guitar or a vocal or whatever, to a bus, but put the reverb send on the channel, not on the bus. So that way on your bus, you can take down bottom and top end, but what you're sending into the reverb is full range. So essentially, you're simulating our proximity to the source by cutting bottom and top end, but you're simulating that the source is now closer to the room, right? It's back in the room. So the room is getting a full range signal because you're sending the channel to the reverb. But on the bus, then you're cutting the bottom and top end a little bit to make it sound like we're farther away from it. So one other thing I forgot to mention about this is that I'm playing with the directionality of the reverb send. So on the closer example where the guitar is close to me but the room is far away, it's sending mono. So what's going into the reverb is mono and what's coming out is just the stereoness of the reverb itself. But on the other example, on the quote room mic example, I'm sending it to a true stereo reverb, the Valhalla room, and I'm sending it on the left. This more closely mirrors what would happen if you were in a room watching a guitar player and the guitar amp was 10 or 15 feet away from you, right? It would be on your left and the source sound would be emanating into the room from the left. So what if I wanted this guitar to sound like it's back in the room in a larger room? Well, it's sort of a combination of these techniques because now the source is farther away from us, so we need to cut some bottom and top, but the reverb needs to be a little bit louder, but not have mostly late reflections, kind of a combination, maybe moving that slider half and half between early and late reflections. And because essentially we're approaching this like critical distance sort of situation where the room sound and the guitar sound are more equal, then their tonality needs to be a little bit more equal as well. So I'm going to cut a little bit of bottom and top from my room. I'm going to cut a little bit of bottom and top from my guitar. I'm also splitting the difference on my pre-delay a little bit. Now, another thing you might have noticed is that that guitar is no longer panned hard left. It is panned about 70% to the left. And that's something that just perspective-wise makes sense to me. Imagine that you're looking down a hallway and you're watching those walls kind of visually get narrower and narrower as the hallway lengthens. You know what I'm talking about? Like when you're drawing perspective. I think that if you want something to sound far away, it can't necessarily be super wide because that's not really how our eyes see things. Now, maybe that's total BS and maybe I'm just making that up, but that's kind of how I rationalize it and hear it, is that if you want something to sound farther away, you probably don't want it hard left and right. That's something that sounds more like someone's really close to your ears, right? And just like in real life, if something is really far away from you, even if it's on the left, the sound sort of just becomes more mono, right? It's similar to like if you're sitting at a drum kit, the hi-hat sounds like it's on your left and the floor tom sounds like it's on your right. But if you're standing 50 feet away from a drum kit, it just sounds mono. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play you all of these examples and I'm going to start with the one where the guitar is closest. And I'm going to gradually fade to this one where the guitar sounds like it's pushed back in the room and the room itself is larger. So my goal with that was to kind of show you the effect of the guitar gradually moving back into the room. And I think it's a mistake to assume to make it sound farther back in the room, all you got to do is give it more reverb. And that's not true. The way that a source responds at a distance versus the way a reverb responds at a distance versus the source being closer to that reverb or closer to you, it's a very different thing. 
Like instead of thinking about it like a reverb, think about it as if you had a close mic on something and then a set of room mics and then another set of really far room mics, right? The tonality of each of those is going to be different. And as you affect the position of that guitar in the room, you would be turning down your close mic and you'd be turning up your room mic, but the room mic has different tonality. As you turn down that close mic, because of the way our ears work, it's going to sound obviously a little quieter, but it's going to sound like it has a little bit less bottom, a little bit less top, not drastically, but the room mic EQ has not changed, right? What's getting into the room mic is the same. So you turn up that room mic and you start to hear the sound of those mics at a distance, as well as the sound of the source at a distance. And then as you turn down the second set of room mics and turn up your really far room mics, that's a different sound still. You're getting more room, less close mic, the sound of the source changes, the sound of the room changes. It all is, this is how I think about reverbs when I'm trying to figure out which ones are going to be used for which purpose. This is yet another argument I have for why I have so many reverbs and delays set up in my template, because you need them for different things. And I like to have 10 or 20 reverbs and delays set up in my template ready to audition, so I don't have to necessarily mess around with this stuff a ton. I at least have some starting places. Now, I just wanted to clarify some things about pre-delay. We talked about it a little bit, but I just wanted to go back and touch on that one more time. The pre-delay and the source sound do have an intertwined relationship. This is what helps you define how close the source is to you versus the walls. So again, if you have a longer pre-delay, let's say 50 to 100 milliseconds and a dark, large reverb, especially if it's not too loud, you're sending the following information to the listener. The singer is in a big space. The walls are far away and they're at least somewhat absorptive. The singer is close to me, but far away from the walls. Right now, if you use the exact same reverb, but you put the pre delay really, really short and you make the reverb a little too loud, you're sending a very different thing to the listener. You're saying the singer's in a big space, the walls are far away and they're somewhat absorptive, but the singer is also far away from me and they're closer to the walls than they are to me because the volume relationship of reverb to dry signal is a little bit too much favoring the reverb. And of course, if you take away some top end and bottom end on your singer, you're also going to send that illusion to the listener. Now, there is a limit to this. I do think at a certain point, usually somewhere around 100 to 150 milliseconds, the pre-delay definitely starts to sound kind of fake and weird. It just sounds like you're delaying a reverb. So typically speaking, my entire pre-delay settings are going to be from 0 to 100 milliseconds most of the time. So just keep all of this stuff in mind when you're setting up your reverbs, thinking about what its purpose is. And if you're really trying to complete the illusion, then every single piece has to be right. You can't just say, well, I put a room reverb on. Why doesn't it sound like it's in a room? Well, there's a lot more to it than that, right? Like how far back into the room? How far is the source from us versus how close is it to the walls? How far away are the walls? What are the walls made of? Are they softer, like maybe partially absorptive, like a studio? Or are they really reflective? Is this a concrete room or like a parking garage or something? How big is the room? How wide is the room? There's a lot of pieces to this puzzle that you have to consider. Now, just a couple other tips when it comes to reverbs or delays that I wanted to give you. Number one, I highly recommend that you do 90% of this stuff on an FX bus or an aux rather than just putting a reverb on your track. This really allows you to play with pre-delays, with EQ, with stereo widening tools, with anything to manipulate the reverb to what you need. Also, don't be afraid of using mid-side EQ on your reverbs and delays. Sometimes that can be really helpful for creating a sense of depth. For example, if you push up some low end and top end on your side channel and or pull down some mid range on the mid channel, it creates this sort of concave effect where the center of your mix, the primary thing that our ears are sensitive to is pushed back a little bit in the center, but your low end from your room is sort of expanded around you and that creates a really cool effect to do a little bit of mid side on your reverb return you can't really do that if it's just on your track 
Now, you might ask, why would I use a reverb on a track or when might I do that? And I think a good example of that is if I'm just trying to extend the reverb time of something that's already there. For example, if I've got stereo room mics on my drums and I've got early reflections, but I don't really have a lot of late reflections, my room doesn't necessarily sound super big, what I want to do is put the reverb plugin on the stereo room mic track. I'm going to be adjusting it to be more late reflections and I can just blend it in a little bit to give myself more late reflections that then will be on the track and affected by my drum bus because I want it to sound like that room mic had more reverb naturally and all the compression effects and cool things that happen when you compress a room mic are now happening on that room mic. So if, for example, you're recording in a relatively dry space and you want to get that cool effect of compressing a room mic on your drums, I would recommend putting up a stereo room mic, then putting a reverb plugin on it, then putting compression after the reverb plugin. That will better simulate what happens when we place mics farther away because you did actually place those mics farther away, but then you're adding some additional reflections early and late to your your room mics to help make it seem like the room was bigger, but then you're compressing after it, which is what we would do if we place those mics in a larger room. So the last thing I want to talk about is perceived depth. And I'm going to talk about some ways you can help create perceived depth in your mix. So the first thing is source size. If you think about your mix as a box and the tracks as things you can put in that box, then you'll probably be able to understand that the smaller each thing is, the more space you have in the box, right? I've used this metaphor on the podcast before, but the important thing to understand is if you want to be able to actually hear the space you've created, then you can't have sources that are just massive. You will have to make some compromises because the way that we hear things, if every source sounds big and huge and upfront and it's taking up all this room, it will be really, really hard to even hear the reverbs in your mix. The low end will just sort of blur together. I mean, this is kind of just how we hear low end. I mean, as you go lower and lower, low frequencies become more omnidirectional. This is true for rooms, it's true for speakers, it's true for microphones, and it's kind of true for our ears. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, how am I supposed to make something sound big and powerful without a huge low end? Well, that's one of the biggest challenges of mixing. It's all about this illusion where you're giving something enough low end to not sound thin, and you're making sure that it sounds large, it sounds powerful, but it's not necessarily taking up as much space as you might think. And that's a huge topic I could probably spend 10 episodes talking about. But like I said, I think it's a really common mistake to make your source sounds all too fat and your reverbs all too thin. This is a recipe for making everything sound really close and in your face and huge. And that can work if you don't have many things in your mix. But if you do have a lot of things in your mix, it's not going to work. It's not going to really have a lot of depth. It's going to sound like everything is close and huge and you will barely hear the reverbs in the background. Now, it's also important to consider the contrast between different elements in your mix and what you're presenting to the listener as your front wall versus what you're presenting to them as the back wall. For example, if your vocal has a lot of top end and a lot of bottom end, and it's supposed to sound like it is right up close in your face, you probably can't get away with also having a guitar have tons of bottom end and top end, or it will also sound like it's in your front wall and taking up a lot of space. So just by the nature of creating contrast between the close elements and the far elements using EQ, you've automatically defined, hey, something's different about that. It doesn't sound as big and huge and full as this other thing that is close to me. And that helps the illusion. That helps sell it to the listener. So it's really important to carefully choose what instruments actually need low end coupled with how loud those sources are. Again, it's all an illusion. Sometimes these things have to sound really bright or mid forward to actually work in the context of a mix, but other things you can get away with having them bigger or fuller, but just turning them down. There are some things like bass that you can't necessarily get away with cutting bottom end and top end to make it sound farther away or back in the room, right? Now, what you can do is create contrast with things that are closer 
faster in the room. So for example, if instead of cutting low end and top end, you add mid range to that bass, that allows you to turn it down because you're now making the mid range more complex by adding, let's say distortion or harmonic content, you can turn that bass down. So it's taking up less low end space in your mix, but we still hear it because it has mid range content. We can hear it on a smaller speaker and we can hear it even though it's turned down. Now, I think it's a mistake to just cut your low end of your bass. Now, sometimes that is the thing you have to do, but most of the time, I don't think it is. Now, this is all really difficult to describe. I'm trying my best, but if I could put it simply, EQ is one of the most powerful tools that we have to make something sound bigger, smaller, nearer, farther, etc. It's not just about tonality of the instrument. It's really complex, and like I said, it's not easy to describe, and it's certainly not easy to master. It's something I'm always working on. One of the most important tips I can give you in this regard is to compartmentalize your EQ processes into different jobs. Jobs, right? Like maybe one EQ is used to fix some rumble or some harsh resonances. Some people might call this corrective EQ. But if you're trying to make something sound brighter or darker for tone purposes, that's another EQ. But a third kind of EQ might be to make something sound larger or smaller or closer or farther away. Right? Often it's a combination of adjusting bottom end, top end, and sometimes even mid-range if it feels too prominent. Sometimes on certain sources like vocal or guitar, adding mid-range, wide mid-range, can make something sound closer. Now, that sounds counterintuitive to what I've been talking about on today's episode, about how if you want something to sound farther away from you, you need the source to have less bottom and top. But again, that's why it gets difficult, because it depends on the source. For example, for example, sometimes your vocal is going to have naturally a lot of mid-range, and if you add more of that mid-range, it seems to make the vocal sound up front. But in that case, if you want your guitars to sit back a little bit behind your vocal, you need to cut some mid-range from your guitars. Not only does it separate them tonally, it also creates a front-to-back contrast. Again, this is all very difficult to describe. Hopefully, I'm not making it more confusing. Now, another thing I briefly touched on when we were talking about reverb and delay is source panning versus effect panning. This is another highly important topic that seems to be rarely discussed. A lot of reverbs and delays have sort of like a mono in stereo out type setup by default. And this is very different than what we might call a true stereo reverb, which takes the input panning into account. I do tend to prefer these types of reverbs because you could always put some sort of a mono making plugin before it on the channel strip if you wanted to narrow your input, but you can't really make a mono in stereo out reverb actually true stereo. The relationship between source panning and reverb and delay panning is complex, and I can't really tell you what every single situation will be like, but I can say that you need to experiment with it. It creates different curvatures to the mix. For example, if you pan a guitar hard left, but send it to a mono slap delay or a delay panned 50 left, you take up less space than you would with, say, a reverb. Similarly, if you have a guitar panned 100 left and you send it to a true stereo reverb with your send pan to the left, it takes up way less space than your send pan to the right. Now, I know this is a bit of a strange analogy, but try to follow me. So, you know the fitted sheet that you have to put on your bed, right? Now, I'm almost imagining the way that this phenomenon works as trying to put that fitted sheet onto your bed. And you're standing at the end of the bed, so you've got your far corner to your left, your far corner to your right, you've got the corner up on your front left and the corner on your front right, right? And you're trying to fit this sheet on the bed. So if you pan a guitar to the left, that's like placing your guitar in the front left corner of your bed, right? And by adding a reverb, a stereo reverb, it's almost like creating this sort of big wide triangle where that sheet is stretching from your front left corner to your back left corner to your back right corner, right? In this sort of triangle where it's not necessarily covering the whole bed yet, but it's just making this big triangle because you have a stereo reverb in the back and your guitar up front on the left. So you've created this sort of curvature to the mix. Now, if you just had a mono reverb panned hard left, then the sheet isn't covering your bed at all. 
right? You're just stretching that sheet on the edge of the bed from the guitar on the left all the way to the back left corner. It has no shape to it. Now, that still can be useful in some situations. It doesn't take up much space, but it really doesn't create much sense of depth. Now instead, what if you had a mono slap delay? So that's more like the center rear of your bed, right, on the far end. Well, again, if you have your guitar pan to the left and you stretch that sheet all the way to the back left and to the center, you've now created this sort of small triangle where it's only taking up a little bit of space. I know this analogy is kind of strange, but it's very difficult to describe and you really should try it yourself. You can actually see this effect on a spatial analyzer like Waves PAZ or something like that. Try taking a guitar and panning it hard left or vocal or anything, pan it hard left and experiment with a mono delay panned center versus panned left versus panned right. Okay, then experiment with sending that vocal or guitar to a stereo reverb at the left a stereo reverb to the middle and a stereo reverb to the right and see the effect that it has on space and how much space each of those take up. It's very interesting to experiment with. Now, another way we can affect perceived depth is with mid-side processing. Mid-side processing is also complex and also difficult to talk about on a podcast. There are a lot of factors at play with mid-side. First and foremost, let me just give you this advice, less is more, okay? There are certain situations where mid-side can be useful and others where it's just overkill. It can be useful on your master bus very subtly to kind of push back the middle of your mix or widen the sides. This again creates that sort of curvature from your mix, making it a little more concave, pushing the center away from you. This also creates depth, even though it's subtle. Now you can also use mid-side processing on buses or effects or reverb returns to do a similar thing. For example, if you pull out a little bit of mids on the mid channel of your guitar bus, then you will give your vocal a little bit more room to sit. It's almost like pushing the mid range backward in your mix, allowing the vocal to sit in the middle. Like I mentioned before, there are some situations where using mid-side EQ on a reverb bus can be extremely effective for adjusting the relationship of decay from center to sides. I really like doing this on room reverbs that are shorter. You can add some low end to the sides and or cut some mid-range from the mid-channel to push the reverb back to the sides of the room, if that makes sense. Mid-side compression can also be useful to help contain the energy in the middle of a mix. And if you think about it, typically things in the middle of your mix need to be contained. Things like kick, snare, bass, and vocal. Now, if you do mid-side EQ and compression right, you can almost get this subtle effect of widening that's rhythmic. For example, if your center is contained with mid-side compression, but your sides are allowed to be free and more dynamic, it can almost create this sort of whooshing type of sound where the center pushes back and stays controlled, but your sides kind of bloom free from the center. And it has this sort of growing outward width thing where reverbs and room sound and all this stuff just sort of rush past you. Again, very difficult to describe. You just got to try it for yourself. Now, compression is another important conversation when it comes to talking about depth. Compression often has the effect of bringing things closer to us, particularly where detail is concerned. For example, if you slam a vocal with compression, then you get all of this low-level detail, and it makes a vocal seem like it's right in front of your face. Similarly, if you compress a room mic heavily, you'll bring up all this room tone and low level detail, but because it's not a close mic'd vocal, it has sometimes a different effect. It creates a bit of a unique situation. If a room mic is loud, then sometimes we perceive it as having less depth, as if the back wall has just gotten closer to us and we can hear it now. But if you crush a room mic, but you turn it down enough, then we hear the depth more often because it's being compressed a lot, but it seems farther away because it's quiet. This is one of the trickiest parts about compression and depth. And it's a perfect example, I think, of why perceived depth is so difficult to grasp and so difficult to talk about. It's very sensitive and sometimes has unexpected effects based on how it's implemented. There's no way I can just say, well, if you crush a room mic, it adds depth. Because how loud is that room mic in comparison to your other mics? If it's really loud, then you're kind of ruining your depth. You're changing the front wall, back wall relationship. 
But if that room mic is compressed a lot, so the details are brought up, but then we turn it down so that it sounds farther away from us, then we can perceive the close mics as being our front wall and the back wall is being heard clearly because it's heavily compressed, but it's quieter, so it sounds back there. Compression and depth is also a game of contrast. If your vocal is super compressed and sounds really in your face, then we'll think it sounds really forward and close to us, closer than elements of the mix that don't have that kind of treatment. And if you treat everything with tons of compression and bring everything close to us, then you're killing your depth illusion, right? And that's not wrong necessarily, it's just a different choice. For example, a lot of Red Hot Chili Peppers records are very dry, very compressed, very in your face, and they're all kind of upfront all the time. But that's not necessarily the right move for every kind of record. Now, as you've probably gathered from listening to this episode, the volume of a source plays a big part in its depth as well. But more specifically, we kind of have to consider three types of volume in this case. There's actual volume, like the literal level of the fader, but then there's implied volume, which is sort of like the intensity of the performance. For example, it's implied that whispered vocals are quiet. It's implied that a really lightly played snare with brushes is quiet, and it's implied that like a screaming electric guitar is probably loud, right? Those things are sort of baked into those sounds. They're almost like smells that we're just familiar with. But then there's also apparent volume, which is sort of the cumulative effect of compression, EQ, harmonic content, and any other processing that makes a source sound louder or quieter to our ear. Now, these three different types of volume have a large impact on what will make the depth of your mixes make sense. For example, if you've got a whispery vocal, it generally won't make a lot of sense to drown it in reverb. Similarly, a really cracking snare hit can sound kind of strange if it's totally dry and has no room sound, right? Our ears are used to hearing rooms get excited by certain sounds and not as much by others. We're also used to the distances and depths required to hear something clearly. For example, if someone is standing 50 feet away from you and whispering, you probably won't be able to hear it very well, if at all. Now, pushing these boundaries in your mix is certainly welcome and allowed artistically, but it may not sell the illusion that you want it to. Maybe the best example I could use that encapsulates all three of these types of volume is a snare drum. If we really want to sell the illusion of depth, then we have to kind of nail all three parts of the volume trinity. The snare performance needs to make sense for what you're trying to accomplish, so if you're doing a rock song, the snare probably needs to be hit hard and have a bit of ring to it. If it's totally dead or not hit hard enough, then it's very hard to fake that with plugins. You're probably just going to have to add samples of harder hit snares. So that's our implied volume, right? Like that's how loud we're telling the listener that this was hit. Next, we have to figure out ways to contain the snare's volume, typically with the use of saturation, limiting, editing, and so on. We don't want it to be all over the place where some hits are soft and other hits are super loud. Generally speaking, we want a fair amount of consistency. If we went with a dead raw snare, a lot of times we'll have this huge transient that won't be heard well in a mix. Apparent volume is our friend here. With the use of EQ and distortion and saturation, we can make that snare more controlled and more aggressive. By doing that, our snare sounds louder, which allows us to hear it better, which allows us to turn down the actual volume and tuck it into our mix. Now, with compression, we can reshape and modify the intensity of our transient. So do we want it to sound even clickier? Do we want it to sound a bit more choked? But after we've shaped our snare, we still have the problem of how that relates to depth. And if we want to sell the illusion properly, we probably need some ambience on our snare. And that could be from a reverb, from a sample, from a room mic or a side-chained room mic, from parallel compression, from a number of things or multiple things. But that too needs to be controlled and crafted to fit in its own depth layer. And typically the implied volume or the intensity of the sound kind of dictates the ambience that it will allow. So if the vibe is hard hitting drums, then you probably need to find a room reverb or room mic sample of some kind that will sell the illusion of these are hard hitting drums in a room. So I hope all of that illustrates the types of considerations that go into volume versus depth. Again, it's tough because it's all a big illusion. And if you want it done right, and if you want to sell that illusion, then it has to be done intentionally. 
The last thing I wanted to talk about with perceived depth is contrast. Now, I have touched on this throughout the episode a little bit, but I just wanted to reiterate that one of the most important factors in creating depth is your contrast, your front to back contrast. We know that when two sources have contrasting tones, they naturally separate from each other, right? Like a scooped kick with a mid forward bass. That's rock and roll, right? They just work together pretty easily without a lot of struggling to hear each one as a unique element. This is contrast. Oppositely, you and I both know that a really subby kick with a really subby bass doesn't work that well. They're going to be fighting the whole time and you're going to have a hard time discerning them. The sounds are too similar. You can't really tell them apart at all. So you generally have to make some kind of compromise, making your bass more distorted, making your kick clickier, whatever it may be. So translate that philosophy into the three-dimensional space. When we're talking about depth, we're really talking about front to back space. So it follows that if you want your mixes to have depth, you need to have front to back contrast. You need some things that are dry and you need some things that are not dry at all. You essentially need to define how deep is my room. This goes back to the idea of defining the walls. So for example, by having a really dry, close recorded vocal, you're telling the listener that this is my front wall, the vocalist is standing right near me. But by having a super washed out piano or something in the background, you're telling the listener, okay, we're in a big room and this is all the way in the back. To complete this illusion, maybe you need to send a little bit of the vocal to the big reverb on the piano as well, which tells the listener, okay, so the vocalist is close to me, but they're still in the same room with this piano. It's just really quiet. There's just a tiny, subtle amount of reverb on that vocal. Because as many of you have probably experienced, if you just leave a vocal completely dry, sometimes it just sounds awkward and detached from your mix. But I think a lot of people take that too far and then start adding all this reverb on their vocal. Sometimes the tiniest amount of reverb can sell the illusion because you're trying to say, okay, I still want the vocal to sound intimate and close, but I need just the tiniest little thread tying it to this bigger space. Okay, so how do you define what's in between those two now, right? So we have our piano way in the back and our vocal way in the front. Well, let's say we want our drums to be back there, but not back wall with the piano. So maybe the snare has a little bit of ambience and the drums have some room sound, but it's not swimming around like the piano is, right? What about the guitars? Maybe they're closer to me than the drums, but not as bone dry as the vocal. And it's a combination of, okay, I'm going to add a little bit of the reverb like the vocal has, maybe a little bit more than the vocal, but less than the piano. And I'm not going to have as much sort of room mic as my drums have. So basically what you're doing is building up these layers of depth, defining, okay, here's my front wall, here's my back wall, what goes in between. Now, when we're talking about contrast, you do have to understand that there's a limit. If you have too many instruments going on and too many layers, eventually the contrast will be killed and you'll get more of a gradient rather than clearly defined layers. It sort of blurs your front to back. So you do have to be careful with this. So rather than me just trying to continue describing something like depth, I thought I would just play you a mix in which I thought I handled the depth really well, and I'll sort of give you my commentary as it goes on. This song is called Beautiful Endings by Eric Hunker, and it's a gorgeous song, and I was very, very cognizant of each layer of depth that I was creating. Something that I haven't really mentioned in this episode, but it's also a very important factor is, okay, so these layers of depth are important, but... Do they always stay that way, or does the mix need to shift over time? And in this mix, they do shift. So I'll just go ahead and play it. We'll start up top. The first thing I want you to notice is how intimate the acoustic and vocal sound. They are very, very dry. And if there is any reverb at all, it's incredibly quiet. But there is a pad that's recorded in the background to have some room reverb on it. And that is defining our back wall. Our acoustic and our vocal are defining our front wall. So check it out. I told you I'd never forget We traded promises there on the edge Said I'd love you till you wouldn't let Now, a piano is going to come in in the mid-ground that is a little bit behind the vocal, but not as far back as the pad. I meant every word that I said 
From the day that we met Till the day that you left And I let go of all the regrets Now once we get to the chorus, the space shifts and enlarges and it's like the lights come on in a bigger room. I could live my life a thousand times i choose to love you Knowing the price I would pay Every day I would choose Beautiful endings I picked you up at your new home now, in the verse, it shrinks back a little bit, but we're going to have new elements enter in the midground. This time, check out the strings. The memories stand like a stone, softened and worn down by time as it goes. So I'm settling When the chorus comes, the electric enters on the left, and again, the space expands and feels larger. I could live my life a thousand times I choose to love you Knowing the price I would pay Every day there's a lot of automation going on to make sure everything grows properly. True love is more than just kids and rings. Sometimes a lifetime is lived in the blink of an eye. Hello and goodbye. Here's to our beautiful and section, our strings get a bit brighter and our drums are still foregroundy, but not quite as foregroundy as our strings. But in this next section, it gets really intimate. Sometimes I wonder what life will bring. New love and the electric guitar will move from back left to front left. Right. Looking for life Notice how the vocal and the drums are contrasted. The drums still feel up front, but not as up front as my brighter, clearer vocal. To this beautiful ending. So in summary, so much of depth is about carefully defining the front to back layers using all of the tools at your disposal, starting from the mic, understanding what's taking up space, what sounds closer to you than something else, using EQ, compression, effects, panning, and all of these things in concert to create an illusion that this thing is farther away from the listener than that thing. It's far too complex to just say, do this and your mixes will have mega depth, okay? I wish it worked like that, but it doesn't. It's dishonest for someone to say that it does. Depth is a sum of all parts kind of game. You have to intentionally create these layers of depth using all of these tools. There's not some plug-in or magic box that will just give you depth. And there's no analog console or special compressor that will just magically give you depth, right? It all starts at the source, the mic, the room, and follows you all the way to the master bus. So for people to be reductionist about this and say, here's one crazy trick to add depth to your mixes, it's really just misleading. And as you can tell from this podcast, it's very difficult, even for me, to describe and put into words all the things that contribute to depth. 
But at the very least, I hope this has given you some things to consider, some things to try, and some things to ponder for hours upon end when it comes to depth. As always, make sure to check out recordingloungepodcast.com. Join us on Discord. The link is right there on the front page of the website. Make sure to send me an email if you have any questions or podcast episode suggestions, recordingloungepodcast at gmail.com. And check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash recordinglounge. If you want to become a supporter of this podcast, head over to patreon.com slash recordinglounge. And I'll talk to you next time. See ya.